morning, everybody. That was kind of hard to come up here after that song. <laughs> I'm going to just sit down there. Good job. Good way to praise the Lord. Well, uh, I'm Pastor Randall. I'm the education pastor here at Greystone. <clears throat> pastor Clay is on vacation, uh, much needed this week with his family. And uh, he is as, has graciously asked me to fill in for him just today. He will be back. We are back in the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. We started and went through half of the book of Mark last summer. And last week, we started back up in chapter 8 in Mark. And we're going to continue in chapter 8 today as we go through this. Uh, we're going to be in, uh, starting in about verse 11 but I want to review a little bit of Pastor Clay's sermon last week and what had just happened as we get started. In the Gospel of Mark, you're actually listening to the words of Peter as given to Mark, John Mark, in the Gospel. And it always helps me to think of Peter in this way. If you're a fan of the Mayberry or the Andy Griffith TV show, I always think of Peter as Barney Fife. And James and John as Goober and Gomer. <laughs> and that makes sense the more you read through the book of Mark and you see how the disciples bumble around quite a bit. And uh, so if you got that picture in your head as you're reading through this, this passage today might make a little bit more sense as Jesus teaches them. We've got three passages that we're going to deal with and we're going to just kind of take one, each one at a time and then put them back in together today. Let me uh, open this up with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into it. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to praise you, to worship you, to gather together as a body of believers. For those that have gathered online, those who are guests, we thank you that we can all gather together and to have fellowship and worship together today. As we open up your word, will you speak to our hearts and to the culture and to the lives that we live? Help our eyes to be open. Help us to realize that once we were lost, but now we're found. That we were once blind, and now we see. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last week we started in chapter 8 at the beginning, and it is the feeding of the 4,000, a great multitude of Gentiles, not Jews. Pastor Clay told us about this last week. It was in a region of the Gentiles called the Ten Cities or the Decapolis where this miracle took place. It is different from the miracle that had taken previously for the Jewish people where they fed 5,000 people. Actually, 5,000 men were counted. There were more there. Uh, you didn't count women and children. In this miracle that had just happened in chapter 8, Jesus has gone to a region of the Gentiles and is talking to them, has been there with them three days. They ran out of food. He performs a miracle by basically creating food for everybody. 4,000 men uh, and women and children are there. There's probably 20,000 people that he just feeds there. He uses the disciples to distribute that food and it says that there were seven baskets left over. Jesus not only meets an immediate need in that miracle, but he gives an overabundance. And we're going to talk about that a little bit because he references it in our passage today. That brings us to our passage today in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 11. And we're going to look at three different instances of spiritual blindness today, or lostness is a good way to remember this as well. Uh, we're going to look, break this apart and look at each passage separately today. The Pharisees, he's going to meet, come and talk to Jesus, and they're blinded by their own arrogance. We'll look at that story. Then we'll see that Jesus and the disciples have an interaction, and the disciples are blinded by their own ignorance. And finally, in today's passage, we're going to look at Jesus actually healing a blind man, and he gains some confidence. So, to kind of put this in perspective about how we can all not quite see how things are, I'd like to show you a story by a man named John Sachs. 
It is the blind men and the elephant. And if you'll, if it'll work, if you'll look at the screens there. We'll read the story as read. The Blind Men and the Elephant by John G. Sachs. It was six men of Indistan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl. God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp. To me it is very clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up he spake. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is very plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, E'en the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact, who can? This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope, then seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant, is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. Moral. So oft in theologic wars, the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. So to illustrate where we're coming from today when we're talking about being blind or being blindfolded or not being able to see completely what's going on, we need to keep that in perspective with each of the passages that we read today. Let's start in the first part of this passage today, uh, chapter 8, verse 11 through 13, where Jesus comes and meets the Pharisees. The Pharisees came to Jesus and they asked him questions. They wanted to test him. So they asked him to do a miracle as a sign from God. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and he said, Why do you people ask to see a miracle as a sign? I want you to know that no miracle will be done to prove anything to you. And then Jesus left them, went in the boat to the other side of the lake. So after this miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 Gentiles, the disciples get in a boat and they go to a place called Dalmanuth. Uh, you probably have not heard of that, but you probably have heard what it's called in Matthew's account of this story, Magdala. Do you know who was from Magdala? Mary Magdalene was from this area. And it was a Jewish town and it was a Jewish area and the Pharisees show up again. They always show up to test him and to argue with him and to, to kind of irk him. And it seems like they were upset by the crowds that had been following Jesus. And his popularity was increasing. And the Pharisees were the big dogs in charge of everything. They were the lay people that were guiding all of Israel in the Jewish religion. The Sadducees were a different group of people. They were in charge of the religious rites in the temple. There's also another group of Jews called the Herodians, which had a political agenda led by King Herod and his dynasty there as uh, ruling in the area. And so we're talking about the Pharisees here today, who were a group of lay people who had a day job, and then at night they studied the law, and they studied their religion, and they practiced their religion. They had very strict rules on how to do everything, and they came into conflict with Jesus quite a bit. Here they show up one more time in Magdala or Dalmanuth and they argue with him again. What they say here is they want to see 
a sign from heaven. Now Mark doesn't use the Greek word here that we usually hear for miracle. That word is uh, dunamis, which means power. We get the word dynamite from that word in our language. That's usually the word that is used when we see Jesus do a miracle and use his power, his supernatural power as the Son of God and as the Messiah. That's not the word that they use here. The word that they use here is simeon. They want a sign. The simeon word indicates that they want a direct sign directly from God to prove to them and everybody that he is the Messiah and that he was sent from God. They wanted a sign similar to what, remember when Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water and John the Baptist was there and a dove came down and we see the dove there and they hear a voice or he hears a voice that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was a sign that John the Baptist could see and hear there. They want something like that where they want fire coming to heaven or they want the voice of God to speak and say, this is my son or this is my Messiah. Please listen to this. Now, why are they asking this? It's not just out of their jealousy, but it's because they're blinded by their own religion. You see, back in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 13 and chapter 18, it tells them how to look for a false prophet. It says this in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 and 2. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after another god or other gods which you do not know, and he says, let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. So, they're actually believing in the Old Testament that if they don't see a sign from God that Jesus using these powers must be a false prophet. And what does Jesus do? This is what he does in the original Greek. <laughs> he gets so frustrated with them that he has a deep sigh. Now, this is the only time in the original Greek where that translation of sighing deeply is used. It's in this chapter. He does sigh another time in Mark chapter 7 when he heals uh, someone and says, he looks up at the sky and says with a loud sigh, Ephaphtha, which means open. And as soon as he does this, a deaf man is able to hear. And that's kind of a sigh. This is a different kind of sigh. This is a deep sigh. It's a very rare word. It's only found right here in this verse in the book of Mark in the entire Bible. It's only found 30 other places in all of ancient Greek literature. It means to be totally so fed up and exasperated and persistent with that unbelief that he just says, Ugh. You ever had that? Yeah, anybody married ever had that happen in your house? <laughs> anybody got parents? You ever hear that in your house? I do that when I'm working on my computer in my office and something will go wrong. They were doing some work around the uh, campus here on the electrical stuff the other day. I had just written a bunch of stuff and typed it up and, and was ready to save it. And the whole power of the whole campus went out. And I'm, ah! <laughs> you know, I have that deep sigh, deep spiritual sigh in Greek. It's there. I've had that. You've probably had that happen to you. Jesus was human like us, and he has a deep sigh. He is frustrated with these unbelieving Pharisees that just want something to prove their own religion. In fact, he sighs so deeply, he says to them, why does this generation want a sign? I, if I would have been him, I would say, did you just see what I just did? feeding 4,000 people here. Did you see the 5,000 people? Did you see the, the water turned into wine? I would have, you know, started listing off, hey, you've already got it. You've already got the signs. But Jesus doesn't do that. He's so frustrated with their attitude and their blindness that he tells them, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And then he turns around and he leaves. He doesn't even acknowledge their request and he walks away. He was done with them. He was fed up, and they got in a boat, and they left. Okay? That brings us to the next part of this passage here. We'll get into the boat. Let's look and continue in Mark chapter 8, verse 14. Let's see what happens next here, where he has an interaction with the disciples. 
So verse 14, the followers only had one loaf of bread with them in the boat. They forgot to bring more bread. Jesus warned them, be careful, guard against the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees uh, and the yeast or the leaven of Herod or the Herodians. The followers discussed the meaning of this. They said, he said this because we don't have any bread. Jesus knew that the followers were talking about this. So he asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you not see or understand? Are you not able to understand? Do you have eyes that can't see? Do you have ears that can't hear? Remember what I did before when we did not have enough bread? I divided five loaves of bread for 5,000 people. Remember how many baskets you filled up with the pieces of food that were not eaten? The followers answered, we fell 12 baskets. And when I divided seven loaves of bread for 4,000 people, how many baskets did you fill with the leftover pieces? And they answered, we filled seven baskets. He then said to them, you remember these things I did, but you still don't understand. You know, sometimes when I see the disciples interacting with Jesus, uh, I'm kind of glad that I wasn't one of the original ones because he really lets them have it here sometimes. Sometimes he gets in the boat with them and they just are completely clueless here. So the disciples had forgotten to take bread. I think that's kind of odd because, you know, they just had a bunch of bread left over from the last miracle. They go on a little journey. They, these journeys across the water where they go from city to city and Jesus teaches are long. So they had forgotten to take bread. They only have one loaf. And if it was me, I wouldn't have worried about it at all because with that one loaf, I would have said, hey, we got Jesus with us. We got, you know, you know McDonald's here in the uh, boat with us. <laughs> We, you know, he's turned water into wine abundantly. He's turned, you know, bread and fish to feed multitudes. We only got one piece of bread. Somebody give it to Jesus and let's see if we can have lunch. That's what my attitude would have been. But this isn't them. They're worried about one loaf of bread. Jesus wanted to use what had just happened with the feeding of the 4,000 and the Pharisees' demand for a sign to take this moment and to try to teach them. And what we see is Jesus teaching the disciples about what's going on here. Now, this is also taught in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke. And it's different when Jesus is teaching here where he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. In Matthew, he says that they're teaching false doctrine. Here's what it says in Matthew 16. Jesus said to the followers, Be careful, guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then the followers understood what Jesus meant. He was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread. He's telling them to guard against the false teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's in Matthew. He calls them false teachers. In Luke, he calls them hypocrites. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. I mean that they are hypocrites. They're religious, but you need to beware of these guys. So what we see here is the teaching of legalism and religion has been done with God's people by the Pharisees here. And Jesus is saying, be careful of that. He's, he's saying, you need to be careful of them using their religion and all of their rules to teach you the way things ought to be. He, we know this. In church life, there are people that are more concerned with teaching the religion and their rules than they are about teaching a relationship with Christ. You know, we have several different rules. I grew up with lots of different rules and lots of different churches and things. I remember at one church I served when I was in college, I was a member of the Baptist Student Union or the Baptist Campus Ministry at Florida State University, and we were uh, asked to go to different churches and lead in worship on our Sunday night activities. And so we would dress in jeans and polos. Was, that was our outfit, kind of like what I got on today. And we would go to different churches. And I was serving at a church in uh, Woodville, Florida, where I was. And so we came that night, and we came in our jeans and our polos. Well, at my church, you didn't wear jeans to worship. You dressed up. You wore nice clothes or dresses a tie, a coat. And so when the leaders in worship showed up that night wearing jeans and tennis shoes and 
polos, nobody listened to what they had to say. There were people that were critiquing what we were wearing instead of listening to the message that we heard. And that happens. I mean, there are Christians that do that. They use their religion, and it spreads through everything that they teach or do or live in a way that's very legalistic. And Jesus is saying, beware of that. It's, it's like the yeast or the leaven in a bread. When you work it through the bread, and that's what makes it rise, it goes through the whole loaf. It's kind of like a cancer when a cancer comes, and it begins to spread through the body and becomes very unhealthy. Or it's like weeds in a garden. If you let weeds grow in your garden, eventually, I'm not a gardener, but I understand that weeds will basically take over the whole garden or the whole yard if you let them. And he's saying, beware of that. Legalism, beware of that. And he also warns them against the Herodians. This is a group of Jews that were basically following the political activity of started by Herod the Great and then his son who were ruling in that area. Their whole agenda as Herodians in Jerusalem right then was to bring about a Jewish rule through political means. Not by following God, but by following politics. And Jesus says, beware of them. And we do that too in our culture today. We always take sides in our politics. And our politics, whatever side we're on, sometimes become our religion. And it becomes more important to us to be right about our politics or the political side that we have than it is about our values or about how much God loves everybody. Jesus is saying, beware of that. But I want you to see what the disciples are doing here. Jesus just makes a statement, says, beware of this leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. Beware of that. You have to be careful of that legalism. You have to be careful of that political agenda seeping into your faith. But what are the disciples worried about? They're worried about a loaf of bread. Now, stop for a moment. Can you see what's going on here? He, he mentions this statement, and they go, start talking amongst themselves. Do you see the problem when human beings get together and we start to reason among ourselves without stopping for a moment to ask God about it? Jesus is right there in the boat. All they have to do is say, hey, Jesus, what do you mean by that? Instead, they gather up into their little groups and they begin discussing it among themselves and going, oh, he must be worried about us having no bread. See, we have things that interrupt us in life. We have relationships that break up. We have jobs that we lose. We have tests that we fail in school. We get bad diagnosis from our doctor. And we start talking to everybody else and making plans and going and seeing consultants and forming committees and trying to have groups to kind of figure this out. And we complain and we worry and we make plans and we never stop and ask the Lord for his help or his guidance. We never stop and pray. We do all this. That's the problem when we do human things. And we've done that here at Greystone. I confess I've done that. I've moved ahead on an agenda without stopping to pray about it. Several years ago, we noticed that the Hispanic community was really booming in our area. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a ministry from Greystone to the Hispanic community? And we had several people in our congregation that spoke fluent Spanish. We had Hispanics in our congregation. I like to order curriculum. I ordered Spanish curriculum. Uh, we set up a website, Vecinos de Durham, Neighbors of Durham. We had all this stuff set up, and then we started to have our ministry, and we started to publicize it, and no one came. You know what we didn't do? Stop and pray about whether that's what God wanted Greystone to do in this community. And it turns out he didn't. We make that mistake when we gather together and we make plans and we have discussions and we form committees and we do things without ever stopping to ask the Lord what he's talking about. Or what does he want for us? Or how is he going to guide us? All they had to do was say, Jesus, what do you mean by that exactly? And instead they go, oh, we're so bummed out that he, we didn't bring enough bread. We're going to worry about this. So Jesus perceives this and he starts talking to them and teaching them. He takes the moment to teach them about it. 
And he says, I'm speaking about the unbelief of the Pharisees and the Herodians. And you need to understand that. Now, I want to sidetrack here because I want to make two little points here of what's going on here. When Jesus talks here, he reminds them about the miracle done for the Jews where he fed 5,000 people plus. And he, he, he uses uh, this teaching. He says, when we had this miracle, how many baskets were left over? And they said 12. Now, the word basket here is a Greek word, spheris. Okay? It's not, um, uh, sorry, that's the wrong word. <laughs> he uses the word kopanos. Kopanos basket is what we think of it. It's like a small lunch basket, like a lunch box, okay? The word that he uses for the last miracle when he says, hey, when I fed the 4,000, how many baskets were left over there? That word that he uses for basket is spirits, and that's a large basket. Now let's talk about the differences here, okay? Jesus performs a miracle for the Jews, and he feeds 5,000 people from all the Jewish tribes how many tribes are there? Twelve in Israel. Then they go to a region of the um, Decapolis where there are Gentiles, and he feeds 4,000 people. And afterwards, they have baskets left over. These are spherous baskets. These are large baskets. The same word is used in Acts. Do you remember when Paul had to escape from a city and they put him in a basket and they lowered him over the wall? You can't do that in a lunch basket. You've got to think hamper size, that kind of basket. And how many did he say that they had left over? Seven. Seven huge basketfuls were left over when we fed the Gentiles. And he, what he intends to show here is not only that he had compassion for the crowds of the Jews and the crowds of the Gentiles, but to build up some faith in his followers. Jesus answers the question where he says, where in this remote place can we get enough bread? The answer is Jesus. Jesus always provides in abundance, and he's drawing out their faith. So he reminds the disciples of this. Now, I also want to talk about the two numbers. And I want to be careful about this, okay? Uh, because numbers in Scripture can mean things like a red flag. What Mark and Peter are saying here and what John does, whenever you see numbers in Scripture, you want to pay attention. They're not magic numbers. They don't have mir miraculousness in and of themselves. But usually they point to something that you need to pay attention to. So here when we see this, you see... Jesus feeding 5,000 Jewish people from the 12 Jewish nations. And how many baskets are left over? 12 small baskets are left over. Okay? Then he goes to the region of the Gentiles in the Decapolis, and he goes to an area that the Jews had taken over from the Gentiles. Here's what happened there. If you go back to, back to all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Lord begins that chapter and says this, When the Lord brings you into the land that you're about to go into and possess, He will drive out the nations that are before you. There are seven nations in that area that they have now taken over. Okay, It was the, let me see if I can remember, the Girgashites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, and the stalactites and the termites or the turn out the lights or something else. Someone with a bunch of ites, okay? Seven nations there that occupied that land, okay? So when Jesus and the disciples go back and they're teaching all the Gentiles that are in that area, he is proclaiming that there is a new gospel, that there is good news for the Gentiles, not just the Jewish people, but the Gentile people as well. And how many big baskets are left over? Seven. Seven big baskets. Could it be that Mark and Peter want to wave a red flag and remind us that the Old Testament matters in the New Testament and the New Testament references the Old Testament in lots of different ways? We need to study all of Scripture, the whole of Scripture, to see how things work together. And there's a flag there to wave that says, pay attention to what he's doing. It's not a magic number, but it is a way for us to pay attention. So I wanted to say something about the basket words and, and the numbers there. 
Okay? All right, let's keep moving because we're running out of time. Okay? So let's go to the last passage here. The next thing, they get in the boat again, and they, they're going across the boat to Bethsaida. Okay? Verse 22. Jesus and his followers came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch the man. Jesus held the blind man's hand and led him out of the village. This is fun. Then he spit on the man's eyes. He laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see now? The man looked up and said, Yes, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Again, Jesus laid his, eyes on, laid his hands on the man's eyes, and the man opened them wide. His eyes were healed, and he was able to see everything clearly. And Jesus told him to go home, and he said, Don't go back into that town. So, Mark is the only one that records this particular st story here. It's the only time in Scripture where Jesus actually touches somebody twice. So it is significant here. Now what happened here is some people brought their friend who was blind to Jesus in this area of Bethsaida. Jesus had originally gone to Bethsaida, done works there. They didn't believe in that area, and he basically pronounced uh, his a curse on that city. He said, you're just not going to be blessed by God. Okay? But what happens is Jesus returns to the area, doesn't go into the city, and he takes the man out of the city where his friends meet him, and he heals this blind man. It reminds us of the friends that back in earlier in Mark where the friends brought their, their paralyzed friend and they took him to the house and they went through the roof to take him to Jesus. Isn't that something all of us ought to be aware of doing it? We ought to, when our people need help, we need to take them to Jesus. We always need to take them to Jesus. These friends who love their other friends so much said, let's get him to Jesus. We need to be like that. So this is what happens here. Jesus had already pronounced judgment on this area, so he takes the man out of there. His doing a miracle in this area would have just stirred things up there. So he takes the man out of the city, and basically here's what he does. He heals a man with a disease-encrusted eyeball with his spit. That sounds repulsive to us, okay? But he does it in like two stages. If you see there, he makes the spit in the mud on the man's eyes, whatever he's doing there, the diseased eyeball, and the man can see a little bit. So what happens? Did Jesus run out of power? Did he forget to recharge that day? Was he just not in touch enough? He asked the man, what do you see? He says, well, I kind of see some images that looks like trees walking around. Then Jesus touches him again, and he can see this time. What's Jesus doing there? He's healing him in stages. First, the man who has never been able to see, can see light and color. What would that have done to you and me if that had happened? That would have prompted a little bit of faith in me. He's drawing out the man's faith. And then he touches him again, and he is fully healed. Jesus does this to draw out our faith. He drew out the faith of the disciples he draws out the faith in this man. And the reason he tells him, don't go into, back, go, go into that town, he says, go on home. You're healed. You don't need to go back into that town that I've already dealt with. So here we've got these three different passages. Let's kind of put them together into one pile of putty and kind of shape it into something to take it home here. So here's what we've got going on. We are sometimes blinded in different ways. Sometimes we're blinded by a hindrance. God has a plan, but we're hindered by the problem. We saw this when Jesus fed the 4,000 people in last week's message. That they said, how are we going to feed all these people? They're blinded by the problem. What's the answer to the problem? Jesus was the answer to the problem. Also, sometimes we're blinded by arrogance, like the Pharisees were. Even when unbelievers have evidence, they are blind, and they sometimes don't see it. We test God, we grieve God, we upset God, and ultimately we will lose God if we stay blinded by our own arrogance, that we're not going to even seek out God. Also here, believers and followers of Christ can sometimes see the work of Christ, but we're blinded by our understanding. We, like the disciples, bumbling around. We misunderstand what Jesus' words mean. 
and we misunderstand what the works of Jesus mean. And we need to take some time to really delve into that and ask him to teach us and to guide us and to explain it to us. And finally, the blind may see, but it comes gradually. We need to bring hurting people to Jesus so that Jesus can draw out their faith. Sometimes he uses illness or hurt or pain or difficulty to bridge that relationship that we need to have with him. When we're talking about blindness, we're all probably familiar with the song that Robert sang. I don't know if you noticed, but he was singing the song to uh, the, the words to Amazing Grace to the music to House of the Rising Sun. I don't know if you noticed that. I like to take secular music and make it fit better. <laughs> but we're familiar with the words. I once was lost, but now I'm found by Jesus. I once was blind, but now I can see Jesus. That is where we need to go. This was true for the blind man in the story. This was true for the disciples. It is true for me. How about you? Let's pray. Father, open our eyes that we may see. Open our ears that we may hear. May each and every one of us turn our eyes upon Jesus who holds all the answers that we need. And we thank you that he draws our faith out in stages so that we can trust him and find confidence. Forgive us of our arrogance. Help us to see beyond our ignorance and give us confidence in our faith in Jesus Christ. Father, there may be some here today or those watching online who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ. And I would just ask you to speak to them. And if you're watching or listening right now and you have not trusted Jesus. We'd love to talk to you more about that. If you're online, we'd love you to contact us on that connect form. If you're here today, I and some of the other pastors will be in the Welcome Center. We'd love to tell you a little bit more about how you can strengthen your faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray all of this and acknowledge you and your son and ask that you would open our eyes. In Jesus' name, in confidence we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship.